Hello and welcome to the final part of this three-part CPD car series on IP and competition law in which I'm still joined by Pat Treacy and Sophie Lawrence from Bristow's. So Pat, in part two we left off with beginning to explain the first part of the exceptional circumstances test where the exercise of an exclusive right by the proprietor may involve abusive conduct. Can you then outline the other aspect of this test? The other aspect of the exceptional circumstances test is that as a result of the refusal to license, there was going to be an elimination of competition, a foreclosure or elimination of competition. One of the questions that people had always raised in the past is, well, if there's any competition, is that enough? Or does it have to be effective competition? Or when is this circumstance actually satisfied? And again, the Microsoft case is interesting because what the Commission and the Court of First Instance held was that you didn't have to wait until all competition had been eliminated. That would be pointless. If you could show that as a result of the conduct in question, it was likely that over time competition would be significantly less effective and actually it might well be that it could ultimately disappear, that would be sufficient. And then finally, the Commission had to be satisfied that there was no objective justification, that Microsoft had no objective commercial reasons for refusing to license its intellectual property rights. And the Commission said, and again the Court of First Instance agreed, that simply saying, well, it's my intellectual property is not sufficient because, of course, that's what the exceptional circumstances are trying to get to. Of course it's your intellectual property. You need to tell me more than that. There has to be a different objective justification for the refusal to license. And the Microsoft case is really a very interesting case because in the 20 years since McGill, or a bit less than 20 years since McGill, the exceptional circumstances test has evolved and changed. And in Microsoft, we do see a situation where some of the the barriers that had to be overcome in order to justify compulsory licensing seem to be a little more flexible than we would have thought. So if you've got to have a new product, but it doesn't have to be that new, we've got to be able to eliminate competition, but not all competition, and you just need to be able to foresee that it will be eliminated. And the information or the IP has to be indispensable. Well, there were server products on the market. You know, the information wasn't that indispensable. And the Microsoft case was one of those situations where I think there's an old saying in English law that hard cases make bad law. I think there was a feeling abroad that perhaps Microsoft was doing something that wasn't quite right. And it didn't quite fit within any of the tests that had previously been applied. So the tests have been flexed a little bit. But of course, the consequence of that is now that the next time we have an exceptional circumstances case, perhaps the tests will be flexed yet more. Because over the time since McGill, it's been interesting to see that the cases just immediately prior to McGill were two cases called Volvo and Veng and Re Renault against Maxcar. And in those cases, it was quite clear that the Court of Justice said, you know, simply refusing to license is not an abuse. And it is foreseeable there might be some exceptional circumstances where it might be possible. But the whole wording and language used by the court was, well, we can't really think of that many, but there might be some. And over the time since Volvo and Veng to Microsoft, we can see uh, sort of little by little, as the conditions have become more and more worked upon, and as people have tried to put more flesh on the bones of what exceptional circumstances might mean, it's fair to say that the hurdles haven't become any higher. How can the acquisition of IP be an abuse? There have been far fewer cases on acquisition of IP. And again, it seems surprising looking at it that acquiring an IP right, so for example by paying to buy a patent or have an assignment of a patent, it seems surprising that that can be an abuse. However, there has been a case where that has been found to be the case. In the Tetra Pak case, this is going back 20 years or so, it was held to be an abuse that Tetra Pak, which had a very strong dominant position, pretty much a monopoly position in um, certain packaging, it acquired the only other available technology. And the European Commission, upheld by the General Court, or the Court of First Instances as it was at the time, um, held that that was an abuse because it effectively prevented all continuing competition from any other party against the monopolist as it was Tetra Pak. 
why is this of interest? It's just a single case. Well, I think we can foresee with the Commission's interest in IP issues, particularly in the pharmaceutical sector, that there may be further cases of this type. And I think companies, particularly if they have a very strong dominant position and there's limited other competing technologies, they need to be very cautious if they then acquire those technologies. The European Telecommunications Standards Institute was founded in 1988. Pat, can you just explain what the purpose of this was more generally? I can, and I'll try and put it in context for this discussion as well. The European Telecommunications Standards Institute is a European standardisation body. And the point of ETSI, as people refer to it, is to ensure the development of harmonised standards for telecommunication products, particularly mobile, but not just, across Europe. Why is this important? Well, it's important because the European Commission foresaw that if Europe was to become a strong player and have a unified market, it would need to have harmonised standards so that products could easily move. You know, if you have your mobile phone in the UK, it's not much use if you can't actually use it in Belgium or France or Germany. And equally, the markets would be very small and very difficult to manufacture for. So the concept was to build a standard which could be adopted by everyone so that people could compete to build better products, but all able to interoperate with each other. And as a consequence of the work of Etsy and and other standardization bodies worldwide, in the mobile telephony sector, there now are a series of global standards with which all products have to comply. And the reason this is important for competition law is twofold. First of all, because many standards contain patents. So the the technology that's incorporated in the standard will often be covered by patent rights. And those are known as standard essential patents. As a consequence of owning a standard essential patent, in principle at least, if you're the owner of such a patent, you could refuse to license it to other people. Or you might choose to license it for a very high royalty rate. And if you did that, you could block people's use of the standard. So there's a very close link to competition law because if we think back to what we talked about earlier and refusals to license that have a real impact on downstream competition you can see that potentially this is a field where that might be the case and the interplay between standards and patents and competition law is one of the key themes in the so-called patent wars that are all over the papers these days you know the big dispute between Apple and Google and Motorola and Samsung and HTC about the ways in which patents are used in the mobile telephony sphere. What does fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory mean then? Fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory means many things to many people. But in this particular context, one of the ways that the uh, standardisation bodies have tried to deal with this problem of potential non-access to standard essential patents is to say, if you want to be a member of our SSO, And if you want to contribute technology to the standard, then we will ask you to give an undertaking that if your technology is incorporated in the standard, you will be willing to license that technology to all comers on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. So that's where the, the concept comes from. It's actually quite closely linked to competition law in some ways because some of the cases that we've had under Article 102 for licensing of technology have talked about giving access to compulsory licensing on fair, reasonable and and non-discriminatory terms. So if you look at, for example, the Microsoft case that we talked about, when Microsoft was ordered to give access to its interoperability information, the Commission ordered it to do so on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. So it's a phrase that has come up in the competition law context and has also been used in a very specific way in the context of mobile telephony standardization. And it's really in that context that the two things are now coming together. Because against the background of the so-called patent wars, we've seen a number of situations in which companies have tried to enforce their standard essential patents against potential new entrants. And they have sought to refuse to license, or they've said, look, you haven't come to us and sought a license, so we're entitled to keep you out of the market by using our standard essential patents. And they're met by the defence that, no, no, that that can't be right because you have undertaken to license those patents to us on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. And if you don't give us that license, then first of all, you're in breach of your contractual obligations to Etsy because you made a promise. 
And secondly, because your standard essential patent gives you the right to exclude us from the market entirely, you're also in breach of competition law. And so you think you see the two concepts come together. And we've seen that in a number of national court decisions in the Netherlands and in Germany. We've seen it in the sense that the, the European Commission has looked at the acquisition of standard essential patents in the Google's acquisition of the patent portfolio of Motorola. And then most clearly, we've recently seen it in that the Commission has opened two investigations that we know of, in fact, three investigations that we know of, into the way in which companies have either licensed or refused to license or sought injunctions to stop people from access assessing the market in respect of standard essential patents. So it is really an area that is developing extremely quickly. Can you just explain then what a patent ambush is? I can. We talked a little bit a minute or two ago about the process whereby technology is adopted into a standard. The concept of a patent ambush is its really quite descriptive. It does exactly what it says on the tin. You have someone who's sitting in a meeting, contributing technology and suggestions as to how a standard might look. And at the same time as they're doing that, they're not telling anyone that they might have technology that reads on the standard. So they, they know that they're applying for patents and they don't give a FRAND commitment. So they just sit quietly and they make no promises and they try and encourage people to use their technology. And then once the standard is adopted and everybody is locked in because they're then starting to produce phones that read onto the standard, they say, aha, now we've got you because we have patents which read on that standard. And if you don't pay us a very large sum of money, you can't use our patents. So it is a patent ambush. Okay, and just moving on then, how do injunctions fit within the FRAND regime? That is a very interesting question, and it's probably the most difficult problem that the authorities and the SSOs are working on at the moment. There are two schools of thought. The first is, if you have promised to license your patents on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, and as a consequence of that, your technology has been permitted into the standard, then you should not be entitled to seek injunctive relief to stop someone from using that technology. Because the threat of an injunction is so great that people will pay you more than your technology is really worth because they, they want to avoid the risk of an injunction. So that it's a big, a very gra grave threat which is really not justifiable where you've actually promised to license. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is, well, yes, we recognize that we've agreed to license our patents to third parties, but there are certain third parties who don't really act in good faith in the context of that promise. And rather than coming to us and seeking to negotiate a license on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, they simply start to manufacture and they don't seek a license. And when we talk to them about licensing, they don't really negotiate in good faith. So either they don't negotiate at all, or they suddenly decide to try and invalidate all our patents through the court, or they engage in other tactics to really make the negotiation impossible. And in those circumstances, because we are patentees and a patent is essentially the right to exclude, it would be wrong to stop us from seeking an injunction in order to bring those people to the table. So those are the two sort of slightly different camps on injunctive relief. And there are a variety of positions in between. And I think one of the principal things that the European Commission and also the, uh, the USFTC and the Department of Justice in the US and, and other competition authorities are currently looking at is where to, to find the balance between the right to seek an injunction as a remedy for your, the infringement of your patent right and the need to ensure that in the context of standardization, where these patents are so valuable and so useful, that right is not misused so as to either block people from implementing the standard or to extract unfair royalties to stop them from doing so. Is there then a competition law angle to this? There is a competition law angle because leaving aside the context of the contractual obligation that's given to the SSO, if you just step back and you, th you think about it in the context of Article 102 as we talked about earlier, the, the theory is that if you own a, either a single standard essential patent or, or a p portfolio of essential patents, you have a position of great strength vis-a-vis -vis your competitors. And it's argued that that gives you a dominant position. 
And if you exercise your patent rights so as to exclude other people from the market, you are really preventing them from competing on a downstream market. If we go back to the criteria we talked about earlier, the theory is, yes, the right is indispensable. Yes, it's preventing, arguably, new products coming to the marketplace. And it is leading to a foreclosure or elimination of competition. And therefore, the competition rules ought to intervene. Now, there are many arguments against all of that analysis, but there's no question that there are certainly issues around the potential application of Article 102 in this context that will be dealt with over the next three or four years. Just discussing then litigation in this respect, is there a right to seek an injunction? That's a very interesting question as to whether or not injunctive relief is in fact a right. I think generally speaking, compulsory licensing is not permitted under TRIPS, which is the Trade Related Intellectual Property Settlement Agreement, which is an international treaty except in certain limited circumstances. And you have to show, in order to grant a compulsory license, it must be shown that there's been a case-by-case analysis of the situation and that the granting of the license is justified, whether by competition law or some other fairly limited grounds. So whether or not you could say as a matter of course that companies that own standard essential patents may not seek an injunction is a very interesting question because arguably that wouldn't be compliant with TRIPS. So if, if you were just to have a blanket discussion like that, there might be an argument about that. Um, leaving that to one side, so do you have the right to ask a court for an injunction? Let's assume that you do. The more interesting question, perhaps, is then under what circumstances should such an injunction be granted or under what cir- circumstances should there be a defence against that injunction. And I think there the situation is, is pretty fluid. I think that is absolutely the question that is currently under really serious consideration, both by the competition of the authorities in the context of ongoing investigations and also by the, the SSOs, the standard setting bodies. There have been recent discussions both within ETSI and within the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, to try and work out whether there is a set of rules that can be laid down, which people can comply with, which will balance the interests, both of the people who've innovated and who've contributed billions of dollars worth of research into the fundamental technology that makes mobile telephones work, and between those who want to come to market and bring consumers new and different products which will base themselves on that fundamental technology, but will bring new innovations and different innovations. So again, as with many of these questions, it's it's about getting a balance between the interests of those who want to come to the market with new propositions and the folk who actually did the underlying fundamental research. In terms of the Commission guidance, where next? The Commission's opened three investigations thus far into this sector. They've got two investigations into Motorola and one into the Korean telecoms company Samsung. And it's a little unclear quite what's going to happen next. The investigations were opened, I think, in the case of Samsung in January 2012 and the two Motorola investigations in April 2012. It's not uncommon for Commission investigations to take quite a long time to come to fruition. And equally, as Sophie said earlier, occasionally investigations may be terminated without any outcome at all. So the Commission may simply drop the investigation if it doesn't think there's actually justification for going forward. There may be commitments. Any complainants may withdraw. So it's a little difficult to tell at this stage what will happen next. What has been interesting is that the Commission has been very active in its discussions with the industry at large and also in encouraging the industry to try and come up with a a sort of industry solution rather than a solution on a sort of piecemeal, case-by-case basis. And the Commission has tried to encourage Etsy and other SSOs to really engage with this problem. Because, as I said earlier, when we were talking about the evolution of the exceptional circumstances case, trying to develop really important principles as to how an entire industry works on a case-by-case basis can be quite tricky because it's very dependent on the facts and also it takes a long time. The Microsoft case has gone on for nearly 15 years. So it's really quite difficult to see how things will evolve, but it's absolutely one of the core debates at the moment about the correct balance between the protection afforded to people by intellectual property 
for their investments and the way in which competition law would like to encourage new entry, innovation and competition on the market. How do you think then the relationship will evolve? I think that the relationship will continue to evolve as it has done over the last 15 or 20 years in that with every case, with every issue that arises, we gain new insight into how intellectual property actually works in order to protect and incentivize innovation and how competition law can best be deployed to make sure that sometimes the unintended adverse consequences of intellectual property protection don't go too far. I think looking particularly in the telecom sector, I think what is likely to happen is that through commission intervention, through national court cases, through the operation of the standards bodies, we will get a greater insight into how some of these issues ought to be dealt with to come up with a solution that maintains a balance. And it, it's a word that perhaps isn't used often enough in this context. It's very common to have folks say, well, you know, really the innovators are the people who should benefit because they put all the money in. Or really the implementers, the people who come later, they should benefit because they're bringing new products at a cheaper price to the benefit of consumers. And actually, somewhere in the middle is probably about right. So it's striking a policy balance. And what you always have to remember about both intellectual property law and competition law is that they're not aspects of, of natural law. They're actually policy instruments, the purpose of which is to incentivize certain types of behavior. So when we decide what we want to incentivize, then we'll know the answer to the question. Is there anything that you think that should be particularly avoided? In policy terms, it's probably not for me to say, other than that I think it's it's clear from what I've said already that erring too, too far on one side or the other is probably not going to be the right outcome. In as much as you're talking about corporate conduct in this sector, I think, generally speaking, being too aggressive on either side is probably not the right way forward because if I'm right and if ultimately a sort of uh, harmonised approach is, is achieved, then probably the right answer will be somewhere in the middle that occasionally you will be able to exclude and occasionally you may have to negotiate in a more active way. But it's it's really far too early to say that's really crystal ball gazing. Moving then to discuss the pharmaceutical sector and the cases in this area of the law, what was the AstraZeneca case all about? Well, we should probably say what is the AstraZeneca case all about because we're awaiting the court judgment from the Court of Justice um, in December 2012. It's been what you might call the leading case in the pharmaceutical sector in recent times. It's quite a complex case. Trying to deal with it in a sort of overview, give a good, helpful overview, there are two angles to the case. The first related to the way in which AstraZeneca had applied for certain rights, which are known as supplementary um, protection certificates. Now, these are rights which are specific to the pharmaceutical sector, and which effectively extend the lifetime of patents. And the reason that's done is because it takes companies a long time to bring their products to market, given all the regulatory hurdles they have to go through. So, again, it's a policy-driven instrument which has been um, granted to pharmaceutical companies to allow them to benefit from the exclusivity on the market for a bit longer in certain circumstances. And what the Commission was concerned about with AstraZeneca's application for these was that it had given incorrect information or misleading information to national patent offices, which allowed it to either gain supplementary protection certificates that it shouldn't have been entitled to, or to prolong those supplementary protection certificates. And the result of that was that it gained or prolonged its exclusivity on the market. The second form of abuse related to um, uh, what you might call a, a switch of products, or sometimes referred to as product hopping. So um, AstraZeneca had marketing authorizations, which every pharmaceutical company has to have to be able to put a product on the market for, I have to say, I can't remember which way around it was. It, it, I think it was the tablet form of the drug in question was held to have had a dominant position. Um, and at a certain point in time, shortly before the expiry of its patents covering that drug, it switched its marketing authorizations to the tablet form. I can't remember which way around I said, well, as I said, I can't remember which, I fortunately remember which way around it is at the moment, but it's tablets to capsules or capsules to tablets. The effect would be identical. 
And what it also did, which is critical, is that it withdrew the existing marketing authorizations for the form which it had switched away from. Now, what's critical about this is that in the pharmaceutical industry, for a generic company to be able to enter the market, it has to produce a product which is bioequivalent and can be proved to be so to the original pharmaceutical product. And by switching away from that original product, the Commission held and upheld, was upheld by the General Court in holding that AstraZeneca had prevented generic companies from entering the market. OK, well, that all sounds very fact-specific, Sophie. What should practitioners take home from it? It is highly fact-specific, but the key point is the fact that AstraZeneca, which occupied a dominant position or was held to have done so by the Commission, was taking steps which allowed it to prolong its exclusivity. And that's something that the Commission is very concerned about because generic drugs are massively, vastly cheaper than the original pharmaceutical product. As I mentioned in the first podcast, it's the cost of production of a, of a drug is actually tends to be very low. So once there's no need to pay licence fees, and once you've incurred all the sunk costs, the costs associated with developing the product and acquiring the relevant regulatory approvals, drugs can be produced very cheaply and that's obviously highly beneficial to consumers and to economies which are to the national health services which are required to pay for drugs because it means that they can make very significant savings. So what AstraZeneca was held to have done was to seek ways which it could maintain its exclusive position on the market and thereby very significantly increase the cost for the national health services really because they weren't benefiting from the generic products which could have come to market without AstraZeneca's actions. So in looking at pharmaceutical cases, the key point is, is the pharmaceutical company doing something which prevents generics from coming to market? And is that something which is doing legitimate or not? Can you just briefly outline then the recent national cases of interest in this area of the law? There have been two recent cases which have a bearing on this. One of them is a case in Italy in relation to the pharmaceutical company Pfizer. And that was about the way in which it applied for certain divisional patents and again the supplementary protection certificates based on those and the Italian Competition Authority reached quite an aggressive decision against Pfizer which unfortunately seemed to be rather short on facts um, which probably as a consequence of which the Italian Competition Authority has very recently overturned that decision so that was possibly a case where the Competition Authorities got it wrong and maybe saw something they didn't like about the conduct but it really wasn't anything that the competition rules could attach to although I believe there will be a further appeal of that, so, you know, watch this space. The other case is a UK case that was in relation to Reckitt, Benkheiser and the Gaviscon product, not the -the over-the-counter one, but a Gaviscon product that is prescription-based. And again, it was to do with sort of this idea of product hopping. So shortly before patent expiry, Reckitt switched its main product from Gaviscon to Gaviscon Plus, I think, I think was the name of the product, and ensured that that was what was listed on doctors' computer systems, so that when a doctor wanted to make a prescription for Gaviscon, it was automatically coming up with this new product. And if that hadn't been the case, then the way the National Health Service um, computer systems work, the generic product could have been substituted for the record product. So by making the switch, record prevented any significant generic penetration and thereby maintained its position of exclusivity, maintained its high prices and prevented the National Health Service from benefiting from the lower prices associated with the generic version of the product. So it's the same sort of underlying principle as as in AstraZeneca. And what does the Commission's pharmaceutical sector inquiry have to say about unilateral conduct? The pharmaceutical sector inquiry was a market investigation carried out by the European Commission into the pharmaceutical sector over a few years, concluding four years ago now, with a very long, detailed report, much of which is really sort of gathering of statistics and evidence about the market. However, in that report, the European Commission indicated that it had concerns about some sorts of conduct that pharmaceutical companies engage in. And I should emphasise that the pharmaceutical sector report isn't a competition law decision, and it doesn't even seek to apply competition law in any detailed fashion. But what it does is it gives a number of areas of concern for the European Commission and it gives an indication of areas in which we can expect future decisions to be reached. And probably in terms of unilateral conduct, the key issue that came up in this inquiry was the concept of a toolbox. It's a slightly strange expression. 
but essentially what the commission was driving at was that pharmaceutical companies, so we're talking here about the originator companies that develop new drugs, that those companies have a number of tools at their disposal to try and prolong the period of their exclusivity and prevent generic companies from gaining a foothold in the market. So those sorts of tools would be things that we've talked about, like these product switches. They might be making interventions for regulatory bodies to try and limit the extent to which marketing authorizations are granted for generic products. There are a number of different issues of this kind which are discussed in the pharmaceutical sector inquiry and which have given originator companies in the pharmaceutical sector some considerable grounds for concern because there's now this sort of halo of uncertainty around these practices which it's not yet entirely clear how that's going to play out in terms of actual black letter law in the future. Following on from that inquiry there have been a number of cases that have been investigated and the European Commission earlier this year, so in the summer, said that it had sent statement of objections, so that's a formal stage in the proceedings prior to reaching a decision in relation to two companies, and we understand that further such investigations are likely to follow. So I think this is an area where there's going to be a significant evolution of our understanding of what exactly, how exactly the law applies to these sorts of practices over the next few years. Okay, so Pat, can you provide a competition law prognosis, so to speak? I think the competition law prognosis is one that both Sophie and I have alluded to over the course of this podcast, and that is that the the law in this area is really in a state of of evolution. The issues are very complex because they're to do with really the cutting-edge interface between two quite assertive areas of law. So I think if you're looking at issues such as refusals to license and the complex questions around standardisation that I was talking about, We probably won't have a definitive position on those things for three to five years. And even then, as with the McGill case, the law will continue to evolve. But I think things may be a little clearer in that sort of time frame. And equally, on the pharmaceutical side, the sort of issues that Sophie was talking about, I think if we've got statement of objections that were issued in the summer of this year, You know, really, if those cases do go to full decision and we then have two layers of appeal, it will be maybe another 10 years before we have a final outcome on what those cases might look like. The AstraZeneca case, which is the current leading case to which Sophie alluded, I mean, that I think the original investigation for back in the 1990s. So I think the prognosis is that it's an area where it pays to keep up to date and to really listen to what's being said by the Commission in all of these little incremental cases. Because although we focused very much on the pharma sector and the TMT sector, because that's where most of the evolution, the high profile evolution has taken place, many of the concepts that come up in those cases are also applied in other sectors. So I think it's uh, a very interesting time to be looking at the interrelationship between IP and competition law. Um, But we won't have any definitive answers for, for a little while yet. Just finally then, to conclude with, you provided a comprehensive guide into the relationship between both IP law and competition law and how they intersect with one another. Can you provide some tips and guidance for practitioners dealing with these sort of cases? Yes, I mean, I think notwithstanding the fact that it's taken us quite a long time to even give the the discussion that we've had in these couple of podcasts, I think people shouldn't be, shouldn't be scared of the re- interrelationship between IP and competition law. There is guidance out there, the, the Commission's guidelines uh, on Article 101 and the Technology Transfer uh, Guidelines. Those are incredibly helpful if you're looking at the licensing aspects of intellectual property and, and competition law. And I think as far as the other aspect, the sort of dominance and abuse issues are concerned, again, although the case law is, is fairly sparse, there are m- not that many of them. So that's a good thing and a bad thing in that there's not that much to, to get to grips with. I think the, the big issue is intellectual property is generally regarded as a good thing by the European Union. The Lisbon agenda is built around competitiveness and around innovation. So it's easy to go away from a discussion like this, which has been really looking at the problems and think, oh my God, every time intellectual property comes up, there's going to be a big problem. Actually, that's not the case. The vast majority of intellectual property actions, be they licensing, refusal to license, are completely unproblematic under the competition rules. And the Commission has been very clear about that. That generally speaking, the acquisition and the 
use of intellectual property is perfectly acceptable under the competition rules. Exceptional circumstances and particular restrictions will be looked at, but that genuinely is the exception and not the rule. Well, thank you, Pat, and thank you, Sophie, for coming in today and for providing a comprehensive examination of IP and competition law. That concludes this CPD cast.